Good evening, everyone. I'm Jessica Green. I'm the Assistant City Manager with the City of Oxford, and we are so excited to have you here with us tonight um, for our first public input session for our comprehensive plan update. Um, tonight with us, we have MKSK, who we've um, contracted with as a partner to help us um, develop this long range plan for the City of Oxford. Um, they're really going to run the show tonight. Um, I'm really excited. I love the work that they've been doing with us. Um, but real quick, I want to introduce um, the um, city people in the room, and then I'll let MKSK um, in introduce themselves. So I'm Jessica Green. I'm the Assistant City Manager. Um, Sam Perry is with us. He's our D Director of Community Development. And Zachary Moore is with us and he is our planner. Um, this is our core staff team who's been working on this with a lot of input from our steering committee and the public. And uh, with that, welcome again and I'll turn it over to MKSK. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Herman. I am a principal with MKSK and we have a great team here with you tonight. I spent four years in Oxford, Ohio and uh, as, a, as a graduate of my university, I have very fond memories of my time spent in, the, in this wonderful community. So again, my name is Chris Herman and I'll let uh, Sarah and Kyle introduce themselves. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Lilly. I am a planner, uh, an associate with MKSK. And I am also a Miami alum, proudly um, of the uh, geography department. Um, and I had a wonderful four years in Oxford and I'm so happy to be back and working on this plan with you all, with the city of Oxford, um, all the community partners. So excited to be here tonight. Yeah, good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle, I'm a senior associate with MKSK. Uh, I did go to Ohio University, but I, I also love Oxford, so I hope you guys will hold that against me. I'm going to be back with you here a little bit later when we do some great interactive uh, Q&A, but I'll let Sarah and Chris take it from here. Right. Okay, so tonight uh, we have a uh, nice presentation for you. We're going to give you a little overview of what we're doing uh, at, for this comprehensive plan update. We're going to talk about existing conditions and where uh, Oxford is today as a community and some early things we're hearing. Uh, we're excited to hear your thoughts on what you'd like to see happen uh, in the community, uh, what's going on today. And then we're going to start the discussion uh, about where what your vision is for Oxford in the future over the next 10 years. And then we'll go to next steps. But we have you here for the next uh, hour and a half. We really appreciate you giving us your time uh, for this very important effort. And with that, we're going to start uh, with an exercise. Okay, let me first review. Uh, we have, we're doing this on Zoom, obviously doing it virtually. Uh, we're looking very much to doing this in person uh, in, in our next meeting. But Tonight, we're doing this on Zoom. So I want to quickly review, if you've not used Zoom before, uh, there are some functions at the bottom of your screen. You should see those. Uh, we'll be using the Q&A box. You'll see that it's highlighted in red there. So if you want to click on that and type in a question as questions occur to you, or if you have thoughts, and you can share them, and then our team will review those and uh, respond as we can. There's, there's a lot of you on tonight, which is great. Uh, and at the end, uh, we'll work on having you raise your hand and for the more frequently asked questions, uh, have some discussion about those. So uh, we're excited about that. But in addition, we are also going to use interactive polling tonight. So you, you feel like you're really here in the room. And uh, with this, we're using a software package called Menti or Mentimeter. So if you see there a two, we, we need you to pull your smartphone out or if you want to go to a, another window in your browser. And if you'll type in that www.menti.com, uh, that will bring you to a web page that will ask you, you can see there are three, to please enter a code. And the code for our meeting is there in the red at the bottom. It's 7803-3740. Again, that's 7803 3740. And then we are going to have some early conversations with you and then some following conversations. So, yeah, we would like to find out 
uh, which of these terms, and you can select more than one, describe uh, your uh, interaction with, uh, what, what's your relationship with the, the city of Oxford, Oxford community. So this is great, you can already see live in front of you. Um, not surprisingly, we have a lot of residents and uh, a number of people at work. I assume there's probably some overlap there between the residents and those of you working in Oxford. Uh, got a number of people that own property, also assuming there's some overlap there between business uh, owners as well as residents. Uh, people that work at Miami, that's great. It's wonderful to see we have some students here. Uh, definitely want to hear uh, your thoughts as you go. And we've got renters, that's excellent. Uh, glad to see we also have people that live in a nearby town or township. Uh, this is a really community plan for the community of Oxford, but it's important to think about uh, the relationships both with Miami University and with the surrounding uh, township areas and community. So that's great. Um, look at that, that's excellent. So you can see we're going to be doing this uh, uh, across the evening tonight. You can see at the bottom right, 69 people have responded. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how many people you don't have to answer, uh, but we really do appreciate you answering because it uh, gives us information and gives us a sense of uh, who's participating tonight. So again, thank you all for being here. Sarah, anything you want to add? Nope, I think um, we're going to go on to the next question now. And we've got some people asking for the code in the chat um, in the Q&A. Right. The code is 7803-3740. So again, go to www.menti.com and then you'll see a code screen and then type in 7803-3740. And the next question, we want to hear what are your three favorite things about Oxford? And you can type them in there on your screen and they will appear here in front of all of us. Uh, don't worry about sometimes it's hard to get spelling. I got fat fingers when I'm doing this as well. Uh, but this will help show uh, what we all like about Oxford. And the larger the word, that means this is a word cloud. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, that means the more often that word is mentioned, the larger that word will be uh, in the cloud. But this is great. So we got 22. We know we got a lot more people to go. Uh, this is these are good things. Again, having spent time at Oxford, uh, community I think is very strong. Oxford's got a wonderful sense of community. Uh, it does feel like a small, close knit town. Uh, agree on the walkability. Uh, and uptown is a special place. Uh, so yeah. It's, with a lot of people, you can really see this moving around. Sense of community, uh, absolutely. Lots of good answers here. Restaurants, transit, I absolutely agree. The system there is wonderful. The natural areas, the trail system, bike trails. This is all good stuff. These students. Diversity, yep. But at the heart of it all, walkability, community, small town, and uptown. I don't think that's probably a surprise for any of you participating. Chris, Sarah, I just want to remind everyone too, that code to join Menti is also right at the top of that screen there. So menti.com 78033740, right there at the top of the slide. Thank you, Cal. That's great. So we have 135 responses. That's fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna come back to that here a little later, but right now we want to give you an overview of this comprehensive planning process. So let's talk to you about what a comprehensive plan is. Basically, uh, this is a policy document to guide the city and all of you uh, as to where we wanna go as a community over the next 10 years. Uh, you can see there in the center and right, uh, the city has had a comprehensive plan, still does today, uh, that's been updated. It was one in 1998, it was updated in 2008, and now it's time again to uh, update it with this new plan. So really, again, this is a policy document. I want to emphasize that. This is not zoning. It's not changing land use. This is a guiding policy document, and it's really an exciting time, and we're glad you're here with us. This is going to be a process that goes through this year. And we want, we, to be effective, this has to be uh, heavily influenced by your input and direction. So this is the start of a, communicate, of a conversation that we wanna have with you. Uh, 
that will then conclude with a plan that says, here's where we want to go as a city across the next 10 years. Here's our aspirations. Here's the things we want to address. Here's the things we'd like to add. So it really is a, a blueprint for policy decisions, for capital spending decisions, for additional conversations and studies and efforts to try to improve the quality of life. Really, it comes down to that for uh, the community of Oxford. And it's a framework. We're going to put this together uh, in an understandable, uh, illustrative way that hopefully all of you can pick up and really understand and see your fingerprints on it and understand and, and agree with where we're trying to go in the future. So that's what we're trying to do. Where are we trying to go uh, in the next 10 years as a community? And comprehensive plans are divided into a number of sections. Uh, one really important one, a fundamental piece, is planning and development. So it's really land use. Uh, what are the land uses that we want to see in the community? Uh, how do we want to grow? Do we want to expand at all? Do we want to, to build up? Do we want to infill? Are there things that we want to change or do differently? Housing is an important issue. It's important in Oxford. It's important really across our country to address the needs of, of housing for our community. Mobility is a large category that really is transportation. But uh, as we've gone into the 21st century, we realize it's more than just moving cars. It's about moving people around, moving people in various different modes. Obviously, Oxford's recognized that. You, you get around, you walk, you have a fantastic uh, uptown area. So this is about how we walk around safely, bike around safely, how we move around, and how transportation and deliveries and all that kind of stuff occur, and even thinking about future mobility. Economic development probably is obvious to you. So it's how do we sustain our community? How do we have uh, jobs and employment? How do we have the services that we all expect? That really comes down to economic development. A two new categories uh, that are important uh, to all of you that we're adding this to this plan is community well-being. So how do we address health? How do we address um, uh, mental health? How do we address diversity and inclusion? Um, all those kinds of things come under community and well-being. We want people to be happy, satisfied, uh, and really enjoy being in Oxford and living in Oxford. And then climate and sustainability, obviously that's a conversation that's on top of a lot of people's minds. Uh, so how do we as Oxford address uh, our needs from a, a climate and sustainability point of view? What things can we be doing? What are the things we're already doing? Where should we focus? And then culture and recreation is also a big category. Uh, culture, arts, the things that really bring people uh, to the community and sustain us. Uh, parks and recreation, the green space, uh, healthy activity, uh, all those kinds of things. Sports, uh, trails, those all fall under culture and recreation. And then we all know that Miami's uh, university is a big part of Oxford. And so the relationship and uh, interaction between the city of Oxford and Miami University, continuing to build those relationships and having uh, a positive uh, relationship, physically, socially, uh, from an education point of view, well-being point of view, all those things come together and what we often call as town gown relations. And then the last category is utilities. This is really broad as well. We're talking about community facilities. Do we have uh, the right water and sewer, uh, stormwater controls, fire, police, community centers and recreation, pools, all those kinds of things, uh, internet, uh, those all fall under utilities. So there's a lot of big categories. Uh, this is really kind of a high level view, but we wanna talk about all these things and uh, how we can continue to prove them as a community. As I mentioned, here's the timeline. So we're really working through here. This is where we're gonna, we've done some advanced homework and we're gonna share some of our early thoughts, but this is where we really wanna hear from all of you, uh, this existing conditions analysis. We're gonna engage you across uh, the remainder of this year. We're gonna come back after tonight and have some discussions about early reactions to what we hear from you, some thoughts on concepts and strategies moving forward. And then uh, in the starting in the summer, we'll be working on putting together a draft plan to come back and share with you. So you can kind of see that on the next slide. I think this is really important. It's great to have all of you here tonight. I want you to go tell all your friends and coworkers and family to come to the next meeting, which is planned in April. And then we'll have another one set up uh, this summer, late this summer, early fall. But 
this, these, each of these meetings build on them. They're not the same meeting. So please come back for meeting two and it will be even more interesting because we'll have reactions and thoughts based on what we hear from you tonight. Uh, and then meeting three, we'll be sharing kind of early drafts of what we are proposing as the comprehensive plan. So again, this is an arc. We want to have interaction with you, but not just uh, this. And we're looking forward to doing an in-person meeting with you uh, April 21st. So please mark that down on your calendars. Uh, we want to make sure we see all of you there and have a great conversation. But also we have a website uh, where we're going to also guide you to. Uh, we'll talk about that here a little later. So you can provide input and thoughts as you have them. And you can share again with friends, family uh, to share their thoughts with us. Sarah, anything you want to add to that or Kyle? No, I think that's great. We, um, you know, Hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, we can have an in-person meeting in, in April. So hope to see you all there. Yeah, these are great, Chris, but uh, we also love to see people's faces and be all together and really have a punctuating you know, public uh, meeting for you know, as part of this really important future-focused process. Okay, so next, Sarah's going to talk a little bit about what we've heard. We had some a little bit advanced conversations uh, and, and started to have a listening session to hear what people want to see again uh, as we move forward across the next decade. Awesome. Uh, so we're really excited to hear from you all tonight, again, using the Q&A box and Mentimeter. Um, but uh, like Chris said, we have already begun community, uh, collecting community input through other methods as well. Um, we have a project website, uh, which can be found at oxfordtomorrow.org. Um, and you may have seen the ideas wall and the interactive map, um, which can be found on the website. We're starting to see some really great comments and ideas come through on those platforms, um, including some things that we hadn't even thought about yet. So um, I would really encourage you all to add your voice to these platforms, um, to encourage your friends, family, neighbors to do the same. Um, and yeah, this will be live for uh, the foreseeable future. So um, feel free to add your, your thoughts and ideas there. Um, this process is also being guided by a 30 person steering committee um, of engaged community members who are really there to act as a sounding board for this plan um, and to ensure that the content of the plan really represents the values of the community. And at the beginning of this process, the steering committee participated in an activity to identify Oxford's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which is called a SWOT analysis. Um, and these are just some of the takeaways from that exercise that we um, heard from the steering committee. So firstly, we heard loud and clear that parks, trails, recreation, green space, and cultural institutions are really a key factor to the high quality of life here in Oxford. Um, we also heard that the compact grid layout of the mile square contributes to a walkable and connected community. Um, but that pattern of the built environment and that ease of mobility kind of starts to disintegrate as you move outward from the mile square. Um, so there may be an opportunity to ensure that residents in all corners of the city have easy access um, to uh, mobility and connectivity. Housing also is um, a key issue that we're hearing. We heard that while Oxford has a variety of housing types, they're predominantly geared towards students and used as student rentals. Um, we've heard the critical need for more non-student housing, especially missing middle housing, um, housing types, which would be like townhomes, attached single family, uh, non-student apartment buildings and the like. In addition to the need for more housing in general, we've heard concerns that affordability um, is really an issue for um, both student and non-student housing. Um, finally, we know that as a college town, the local economy and tax base is heavily dependent on Miami University and the student population. We uh, have heard the need to establish a year-round and more diversified economy um, here in Oxford. So these are just the beginnings of what we're hearing. And again, we want to hear from you all tonight um, and through the online activities that I mentioned so that this plan really is representative of the whole Oxford community. Hey, Sarah, so, one, thing, one oh, yeah. thing to add to, 
we're talking a lot about uh, uh, tech here uh, with the Mentimeter and uh, the fact that we're doing this on Zoom. So all of you have some good uh, good skills already. But for those of you that would like to participate through uh, paper or postcards or those of you that know people that would much rather prefer to interact with this process that way, please know that we have We'll have paper copies of the surveys and, and uh, postcards around town so that people can pick those up and answer that way if that's what they prefer to do. So just so you know, it's, it's not just digital. There are other means to engage with this process. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That's a great point. Um, so before we get to some more of those Mentimeter questions, we want to take an opportunity to explore where Oxford is at today in a number of topic areas. Um, those ones that are all kind of part of the components of a comprehensive plan. And this is really going to help set the stage for the plan moving forward. Um, I should also mention that there's a lot of information on these slides. Uh, we'll be posting um, these to the project website so that you can uh, digest them a little bit more after tonight. So first up, we have this non-exhaustive list of some of the wonderful city policies, programs, and initiatives that are already underway here in Oxford. Um, this includes things like the Oxford Area Trail System, which has two completed phases so far, the recent installation of electric vehicle charging stations in the uptown parking garage, the planning that's underway for an Amtrak stop and multimodal transit facility, things like a food scrap composting program, and many more opportunities for participation in various city committees, uh, like the Climate Action Steering Committee and the Housing Advisory Committee. So Oxford is doing um, great things. This is just a, again, a brief snapshot, non-exhaustive list of some of the amazing things that the city and all the partners and organizations are doing to create a high quality of life here in Oxford. So this study area map on the screen depicts the existing city boundary um, in the dashed red line. All of the unincorporated areas just beyond the city boundary are located either in Oxford or Milford townships. Um, within the city boundary, we do see a few of those donut holes as we sometimes call them, um, areas that are within the city boundary but are still unincorporated and surrounded by um, incorporated areas. And I should also note that in Ohio, property owners are typically the ones who are requesting to be annexed into a jurisdiction in order to get city services um, and things like that. So typically annexation, um, again, is at the request of property owners. And speaking of annexation, um, this next series is gonna show kind of how Oxford has grown over the years, both in land area and in population. Uh, so we know that Oxford was incorporated in 1830 with the original mile square, which is shown here. Um, and like the name suggests, encompasses about one square mile. And if we skip ahead to 1940, at this point, Miami University is um, well established and Oxford has a population of almost 3000 people. From 1940 to 1949, Oxford's population increased by about 150%. Um, and in the graph here at the bottom, um, the Oxford city population is in the blue bars and Miami's student enrollment is in the red line. In the 50s, the population increases slightly, but the land area of Oxford increases pretty substantially to the south and also somewhat to the west here. Again, in the 60s, we see pretty significant physical growth and a population increase of about 100%. In uh, the 70s, there's steady growth, uh, some annexation to the south. And again, in the 80s, there's pretty steady growth. In the 90s, there's a bit more population growth and quite a bit more uh, annexation, mostly to the east and the west. And the early 2000s, again, show more physical growth, but actually a slight decrease in population, which is really interesting. Um, and that brings us now to present day um, with a population of about 23,000 people. So when we break down the city's population by race, race, ethnicity, and age, we can start to kind of point out some trends. So we can see that there is um, steady diversification of the population by both race and ethnicity. 
with the exception of those who identify as American Indian or Alaskan Native alone. Um, but there was pretty significant growth of people uh, from 2010 to 2019, um, pretty significant growth of people who identify as Asian alone, as Black alone, and for folks of any race that identify as um, Hispanic or Latino. And when we look at age, especially from 2000 to 2010, um, here where the population decreased, it appears that some of that decrease was from families um, and families leaving the community because we saw a decrease in folks aged 35 to 54 here. Um, and we also saw a decrease in, uh, in children at that same time. So, but at the same time, we are seeing an increase in folks over 55 years, which um, could be further compounded by the fact that Oxford has attained age-friendly status from the AARP and really continues to be recognized as a great place to retire. And we are also starting to see that, um, that trend in the families decreasing, potentially starting to reverse as well. So, um, so the median household income um, in Oxford is a little over 30,000 uh, per year. But when we break that, that, break that number down by census block group, we can see where some disparities uh, are existing. So the lower incomes of the mile square generally makes sense given that that is where the student population predominantly lives and that um, population is gonna have um, you know, slightly lower incomes. Um, but we also see some clear boundaries divided by the rail line here um, between the neighborhoods around the country club and the manufactured home community and apartments to the north of, of the railroad tracks. So um, this just shows where, you know, there might be some, some physical patterns and where um, there's income disparities. Next up, um, this map is depicting the existing land uses in the city and its surroundings. So we know that university uses really dominate the east side of the city. Um, this map is also going to show us where non-university pockets of employment uses are located, things like um, industrial, health and medical, government facilities, these sort of blue and purple uses, as well as these red uses, the commercial and mixed use areas. Um, also shown here in the red hatch are areas of substantial change since 2000. So we know that there's been a number of new developments and also some redevelopments in the city since 2000. Things like um, new subdivisions, the Knolls, um, Stewart Square, Bishop Square, and Miami Preserve, um, new kind of commercial development and redevelopment, um, the Walmart on College Corner Pike up here at the top, um, the new Talawanda High School, and quite a bit of uh, new, new activity, redevelopment activity on um, campus as well. So if we just look at those kind of commercial and mixed use land, uh, land uses are, we can see some patterns and also some different characteristics of, of those areas. So Uptown obviously is a node of commercial activity. And this is really where unique local destination retail exists in the city. We've also got the mixed use Stewart Square um, which provides a mix of local and convenience retail options for residents. The South Locust Street Corridor um, is a major kind of convenience center within the Mile Square. Um, it has a bit more of a suburban development pattern with large surface parking and larger setbacks from the street. And finally, College Corner Pike contains very auto-oriented retail with um, you know, those drive-through type of businesses, strip malls, and even the larger footprint um, of the Walmart shopping center as well. Also kind of relating to the character of, of Oxford are all the historic buildings, which are pretty well concentrated within the mile square. Um, many of these buildings are single family homes, which have been converted into student rentals. And the city has three historic districts in place covering the uptown area, um, the area just off of campus here, the University Historic District, 
and also the Western Historic District covering Western campus. And these districts are overseen by city staff and by the Historic and Architectural Preservation Commission to kind of protect and enhance structures within these districts. They kind of add a, a layer of regulation um, within these areas. So now we're kind of switching over to housing, which we know is a key topic for Oxford um, and really everywhere right now, but um, we know that it's, it's really a big issue um, for this plan. So Oxford has a, actually a really good diversity of housing types and um, interestingly has more multifamily units than single family units. Um, a bulk of the housing units in Oxford are rental properties. Um, so this, this graph here on the right um, is kind of showing the, the breakdown of housing units by housing type. So again, more multifamily units currently than single family. Um, and 75% of the single family homes in Oxford are owner occupied. So we know that there's some of those single family housing types in the mile square that are those student rentals, um, that 25% there. Um, when we look at the owner occupied units by value, we find that more than 60% of them cost between 200 dollars and $400,000. So again, we've heard, um, you know, affordability is an issue for both rentals, non-rentals, student and non-student housing. Um, so that's definitely something we're going to be digging into a little bit more and something that this, this plan seeks to address. Um, also related to housing, Oxford recently completed a housing needs assessment, which took an in-depth dive um, into all these housing issues. And these two tables here kind of summarize just a few of the findings from that report. So first, the top chart um, documents the median or average housing costs for different housing types. And we see um, student rentals are pulling pretty significant rents. There's a market there. There's um, a, a steady demand for the, that housing type in Oxford because um, there's a steady student population. Um, those rents are double or sometimes even more than double the cost of non-student housing. So it's really very interesting to look at those, those trends. Um, the study also identified the gaps or the needs in housing, which is summarized here in the bottom chart. So the, the housing needs assessment identified an, a need or a gap for all types of housing in Oxford, but there is a critical need for rental housing for low-income households, which are those that are making $43,000 or less per year. And a high need exists for rental housing for households making more than 69,000 and a high need for owner-occupied housing for those, those folks as well in that category here. Okay, I'm, I'm going through this information fast, but again, I know um, it, it is a lot to take in, but these will, be, these will be posted online after the fact. So um, and feel free again to submit any questions you have to the Q&A box throughout the presentation. So now we're gonna switch over to mobility and transportation. So the map here is depicting the classification of roadways in Oxford and the annual average daily traffic volumes that those roadways carry. Um, so just the to simplify it, the daily traffic volumes um, that all of the roads here um, shown in the colors are carrying. So US 27 is the principal arterial roadway. It bisects the city um, and it is carrying the most daily traffic um, in and out of Oxford. Um, we also have uh, State Route 73 here in yellow, Chestnut Street and South Main Street, um, which are also arterials. They also are carrying a pretty substantial amount of traffic. Um, and they're also connecting to US 27 uh, for folks. And uh, State Route 73 is bringing people um, to and from Oxford as well. The teal and the tan roadways shown on this map are collectors. So they're really gathering traffic from the local roadways and, and funneling that, uh, that traffic to the arterial roadways. 
And the majority of the roadways are actually not in, in a color here. They're all the local roadways that are in the subdivisions and um, more of those local streets that are in white on this map. Um, and those are typically lower speed roadways and they're really providing access to all the development and, and all the places in Oxford. So Oxford also has a pretty significant pedestrian and bike network, which is appropriate given the student population who for at least two of their years um, on campus have a limited access to vehicles. And while, while there are some shared road uh, facilities for bike facilities, um, and there are some bike lanes as well, there could be more opportunities potentially with this plan. Um, to kind of facilitate biking as a, as a mode of commuting for students and non-students alike. We've also got the development um, here in the light green and in the dark green of, of multi-use trails like the Oxford area trail loop and those trails that are found in um, you know, the parks and things like that. Um, and these facilities, multi-use trails tend to be a little bit more oriented towards leisure and recreation than transportation. But if they happen to connect to those on-street facilities, they can really facilitate more cycling as a mode of transportation. And um, there, and shown in purple here are the sidewalks and there are some gaps in the sidewalk network that we can see, um, especially as you start to move outward again from the mile square, which is really the walkable core. Um, and so maybe there's an opportunity to, to think about how do we really make sure that everyone in all corners of the city is, is connected by sidewalks and, and bike facilities. Um, and additionally, sidewalk quality can sometimes be a barrier to pedestrian activity and accessibility. So I really love this map. Um, this is a heat map using Strava data. And Strava is an app that people can use to track their walks and runs and bike rides and things like that. Um, so, you know, Strava data is going to lean a little bit more towards those leisure trips rather than commuting trips. But what this map shows really is all the activity that's going on um, in and around campus and through the, the parks and preserves, especially on the east side and at Oxford Community Park. Um, you can even see on this map where, you know, people are using this app to track their, their runs on the little um, running tracks at the high school and Chestnut Fields and at Jaeger Stadium. So um, this is showing you, you've got an active um, community that's really interested in, in being active and walking and biking and running and things like that. So um, I just really, really like how this map looks. So um, next up is uh, looking at the Butler County Regional Transit Authority, the BCRTA. Um, bus routes and stop locations in Oxford. Um, generally speaking, these routes are, are serving the student population well. Um, they're you know, connecting in our campus, in and around campus, and within the mile square to all those more student-oriented housing areas. Um, but they're not really making their way beyond that. So again, if, you know, this plan could, could help to address um, some of these gaps in, in sort of mobility and connectivity within the city, especially non-vehicular um, connectivity and mobility. Again, um, focusing here on mobility, uh, this map is depicting the rail line and the national designated truck routes in Oxford. And both of these um, can be seen as barriers to mobility but they can also be seen as an opportunity. Uh, so here in the purple, we see the Amtrak line, which bisects Oxford. Um, and this line is currently serving the Amtrak Cardinal route, which makes its way all the way from uh, New York to Chicago. And the nearest stops to Oxford are in, in Cincinnati and I believe Connersville, Indiana. Um, so there's, we know that there's planning underway to you know, try to get a an Amtrak stop on this line um, here in Oxford, which would be just really, um, really substantial, I think, for for the city and for you know all the all the community members in the in the community. But you just start to think about how 
you know, students could be coming to and from Oxford without needing a car. And um, yeah, so that would be, that would be really um, a big deal, I think, for Oxford to get that stop. We also have the truck routes in blue, which are bringing, you know, trucks are bringing freight and goods to Oxford, which is essential. But the truck route, um, we know, you know, goes right through uptown and that can really pose some noise and safety concerns, especially for pedestrians and, and you know, people strolling through uptown. So um, these are, again, barriers, but also potentially opportunities for this plan to address. So we heard loud and clear from the, the steering committee that parks and open space are really major assets to creating a high quality of life for residents in Oxford. And this map is showing where those spaces are. Um, the more public facing parks and um, open spaces are shown here in the dark green, the parks and preserves. Um, these are owned by um, the city of Oxford, um, owned and operated by the city of Oxford, by Miami University, by um, organizations like the Metro Parks of Butler County and the Foundation Trust. Um, so a number of different parks and recreation facilities um, that are located within Oxford. We do see, you know, this really significant, oops, sorry about that. Um, we do see this really significant green belt here that's kind of formed on the eastern side of, of the city. And a lot of those spaces are more of those passive parks and preserves and forested areas. Um, most of the public active, more active recreation facilities are kind of found on the west side with the Tri Center and Oxford Community Park. Um, and then you've got, you know, even more of those regional parks and amenities close by things like Houston Woods, it's just off the map, um, and Four Mile Creek Metro Park uh, to the south. So really, these are significant assets. And obviously, too, you know, you have less public green spaces like the country club and cemeteries even campus i i consider to be very green um, the, with all the quads and things like that so all of this contributes again to the character of oxford um, and you know it's something that this plan can really help to celebrate the the parks and open spaces in oxford again i kind of mentioned the difference between passive and active um, so this slide is kind of depicting that spectrum of, of park types that you have here in Oxford, ranging from the very, very passive um, preserves and forests, which might just be accessible through, you know, dirt hiking trails, all the way to the very active, highly programmed facilities like those found at Oxford Community Park and the Aquatic Center, and you have everything also in between. Um, so really, really great amenities here. Also important to the quality of life in Oxford are cultural facilities, which are shown here in purple. So many of these assets um, are found on campus and they're university owned kind of facilities. Um, but I, I really see this as being a huge perk and a positive to being a college town, to have a number of assets like these and all the programming that goes on in and around campus with all the different arts and culture programs and performances and things like that within easy accessibility for, for most folks in the city. So just having these facilities is great, but we also want to make sure that they're accessible to folks. So I, I really love this slide. It's comparing park access um, in Oxford with other similar sized not always similar size, but similar college towns um, across the country, really, because in looking at this, there aren't a lot of great comparisons, even right here in Ohio. Um, so this data is from the Park Score Index from the Trust for Public Land, and it's showing that 83% um, of Oxford residents are within a 10 minute walk of a park. And that is pretty amazing when you compare that figure to the national average of 55% of people um, nationwide are within a 10 minute walk of a park. And even when you look at other similar college towns like Bloomington, Indiana um, at 75%, Athens, Ohio at 
So really based on this comparison, Oxford is quite a bit closer to places like Eugene, Oregon, Boulder, Colorado, that are really known for their stellar parks and recreation amenities. Um, so you're doing a great job. Of course, there's always room for improvement. Um, and ideally every resident would be within a 10 minute walk of a park. So uh, again, I'm setting the stage here with all this. Um, we wanna hear from you. You know, If you have ideas of, of parks and recreation um, facilities that are missing in Oxford or that you would like to see more of or where it might be missing, um, feel free, feel free to, to share those ideas with us. We'd love to hear it. That'd be a great one to put on the interactive map, actually. <laughs> okay, so the last topic before we hear more from you is about economic development. Um, so we know that this is um, an important topic um, for this plan to address. And here we have a map uh, showing where and how many jobs are located in Oxford. And these are both part-time and full-time jobs. So we obviously see this, this big circle around Miami University. And we know based on the pie chart here um, at the bottom that Miami represents more than half of the city's employment. Um, but we also start to see some other hotspots like McCullough Hyde Hospital. The public schools are showing up on this map. Um, things like also Wildberry and Schneider Electric on College Corner Pike. Um, what else do we see? all the jobs that are associated with the, the shopping centers um, and really um, impactful are all the, the smaller circles here in Uptown. Um, while they're not as large as this one big circle uh, of Miami University, they're still very significant and impactful to the local economy. Um, on the other side of that coin is that some of those jobs, especially in Uptown are dependent on the student population to sustain them. So one of the questions we'll be kind of exploring in this work is how do we create more of that year round economy? Okay, so now we're kind of zooming out and looking at things from more of a regional perspective. So this is a heat map of where people who live in Oxford work. So where, where Oxford residents are working. Um, we see here on the pie chart that about 36% of residents are kind of probably working in the general Oxford area. They're traveling less than 10 miles um, on their commute. Um, we also see that downtown Cincinnati is a major hotspot or really the urban area of Cincinnati, um, as well as kind of the Westchester or just the area just north of 275 is, is another hotspot that's showing up on this map. Um, and even the Dayton area, um, kind of gets cut off here, but that is showing up as another hotspot. And where folks are working and um, where they live is really essential for kind of fiscal health of, of public institutions. So I'm gonna kind of get to that point shortly. Um, this heat map, however, is, is the reverse of the previous one. So this is where people who work in Oxford are living. And again, we're seeing that kind of overlap of um, people who are lit, both living and working in Oxford. Um, we also are seeing that the Hamilton area is potentially a hotspot to um, attracting people to, to live there um, while not being too far from Oxford. Um, so I see a question, sorry, that the economic data is from 2019. Um, the, this is the latest vintage of data from the US Census Bureau for um, this particular type of data, the economic data. But as much as we can, we will be using the most up-to-date figures um, from the census and other um, reputable sources of data. So, but yes, 2019 is the latest vintage of data for this particular employment data set. Um, so we, we do see that um, on this map that uh, other people are coming from more urban areas of Cincinnati, as well as even like Middletown. And even some folks are, are coming from um, Indiana or living in Indiana to work in Oxford. So I mentioned that where people live and work is important. And um, this is kind of showing this, these next few slides are gonna hopefully illustrate why that's important. Um, so this chart is showing 
where Oxford's, the city of Oxford's funding is coming from for all of the services that they provide to the community, um, which are many. Uh, there's so many great services. And I, there was that slide at very, all the way back at the beginning showing just some of the things that Oxford is doing. And so, but they have to have funding to do those amazing things. So the biggest piece of the pie um, here at 43% is coming from income taxes. So that is why jobs are so critical to the fiscal health of the city. We also see that um, grants are contributing a lot to the city's revenues and things like the OATS um, system and uh, property taxes are coming in at 11%. But the really big takeaway here is that municipal finances are heavily dependent on income taxes. And that's very relevant for a comprehensive plan because this is really our opportunity as a community to determine where and how much future commercial and employment oriented uses we want to see in the city. So uh, the next slide is showing, looking at those property taxes, um, which are about $1,500 or $1,500 per year per 100,000 of property value. And so this is showing where that those property taxes are spent, where they go. Um, and so while income taxes are important for the city, property taxes are really going to fund things like schools, like um, Butler County and all the services that they provide, the townships, um, amenities like the Metro Park and the library. So property taxes are really going, especially, you know, predominantly towards school districts, but also to some of those other more regional services. So again, just to reiterate, uh, in Ohio, it's different for every state, but in Ohio, income tax is essential to cities and property taxes are essential to schools and townships and countywide services. So again, this comes back to kind of the land uses that we designate in Oxford and that land use is an essential component to a comprehensive plan. So um, if we have lots of residential uses, that'll be great for the school district. Um, if we have lots of employment uses, that'll be great for the city, but we can't, we can't have just one or the other, we have to have a balance. And so that's really where, um, you know, we want, the community, we want to hear from you all about what that right balance is for you, for you all and how um, Oxford's character can really be kind of preserved um, while still maintaining that balance. So this example just kind of helps to illustrate how that tax structure intersects with land use, which again is a key component of comprehensive planning. Um, this is an example from Dublin, Ohio, which is a suburb of Columbus. So these numbers will look a little different for Oxford, but generally this, this kind of helps to paint the picture. Um, so this graph is showing the annual net fiscal impacts of different land use types. So on the left side of the line, on the left side of the graph, we have, uh, we see that basically all residential land uses have a negative net fiscal impact for the city of Dublin in this case. Um, meaning that the city is spending more on services like water, sewer, trash, emergency services, things like that, than they are collecting in revenues from those uses. On the right side of the graph, we are seeing um, commercial uses. And as we can see, retail is the only commercial use that has a negative net fiscal impact per 100,000 square feet. I should have mentioned that, that this is per dwelling unit on the left side, and this is per 100,000 or I'm sorry, 1,000 square feet of commercial space on the right side. And retail is the only one that has a negative net fiscal impact, uh, while the other uses are bringing in more revenues for the city than the city is spending to service those uses. So there's a few caveats to this graph. Um, first, again, this is, the numbers will look a little different for Oxford, and it's, it's um, not every city needs to do this, this type of analysis, in this case, Dublin, um, Ohio wanted to run this type of analysis. But really more importantly, um, just because a land use has a negative net fiscal impact does not mean that it's not adding value to a community. So we often hear from communities how much value retail establishments are bringing to their city. They love their local businesses, their restaurants, their shops, 
and they really add to the character and the importance of that place. So just because retail on this particular you know, graph it has a negative net fiscal impact does not mean that it's not adding value to the city of Dublin in other ways. Um, parks are not shown on, the, on this graph, but if they were, they would show that parks are not bringing really any revenues for the city. But we know that parks add a lot of value to a place in, in many other ways. So um, the point of this graph is to illustrate that in order to offset some of the costs for things like um, residential neighborhoods, parks, retail, the city needs to be you know, collecting income tax from other sources like office and institutional sources and industrial jobs, things like that. All right, you've heard me talk a lot um, about where Oxford is at today. Uh, we want to hear from you all um, and, and thank you again for, for submitting your, your questions into the Q&A box. Um, but we wanna hear from you all and better understand your vision for Oxford tomorrow. So I'm gonna to kind of turn it over to Kyle May from the MCSK team to facilitate some more of those Mentimeter questions. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Great information. Uh, as you guys can tell, we mean it when we say the word comprehensive. <laughs> There's a lot that goes into this uh, this type of study, um, and it, it's necessary. And you, you know, one of the things I think Chris said early on, uh, if you didn't, I'll say it for him, is that you know this is an activity that great communities do regularly, right? They're proactive. They think about the future. They study who they are right now. They take snapshots, like Sarah just. Uh, just walked through um, of themselves from many different angles, uh, economics, demographics, place based criteria, all those things make for great communities uh, and, and great communities think how they could be even greater. So we want to turn to you. We want to ask some big questions now. Uh, we're right at the forefront of this. You know, we've learned a little bit from stakeholders, but there's a lot more to be learned. Um, and as we get going, we've got 100 plus people on. That's really great. We appreciate all of you for being on there. Got three people that have called in. Really appreciate you as well for joining us. If you have any trouble accessing the Menti because of the tech you're using this evening, remember that we've also got physical forms that are available uh, at City Hall. Also have physical forms that you can download on the project website, which we'll flash at the end. But Sarah, when we click to that next slide or move into our um, move into our Mentimeter um, activity, so you guys are all familiar here. You're experts now on how to use. The, the technology we're utilizing. So let's let's revisit that. If you've put your cell phone away, why don't you go ahead and grab that uh, again? And let's pick up on some big questions here that you know help us as we move forward find the right focus uh, in our work. So remember, if you got your phone uh, in front of you, you're just going to go to menti.com using a Safari or a Chrome browser. Uh, you're going to then type in that code. 7803-3740. You may still already be logged uh, in on there. But I, I want to start with, uh, again, a big question. These are all big questions tonight. When we come back to you, we'll have a little more focus. But let's talk about the three most important things, most important to you, most important things you would change or improve about Oxford. Tough question. It's a great community. You already told us a little bit about that earlier, but every place has things that they can work on, uh, whether it's, it's Paris, France or Paris, Texas, all these communities consider the future. Lots of things popping up, but one guy in the middle, we have heard a lot about Chris, uh, and that has to do with housing. Um, this issue has really come to the fore in places across the country, across the state, and here in uh, Oxford, it's, it's no different. Housing affordability, housing variety. Um, you have a lot of dynamics in your place based on the fact of being a, a college community. You know, Chris, as, as we've looked at this, one of the things that popped out for me from Sarah's sharing had to do with the product mix in Oxford. The fact that you actually have more multi-unit uh, um, uh, uh, housing types and you do single family. That's really rare, really rare across the country, Chris. Um, 
What are some other things popping out on this list that, that interest you, Chris? Well, we've also heard things about, you know, restaurants type, you know, a selection of restaurants, family friendly and, and other things like that. And that's showing up here, um, you know, some of the retail services. Again, that's not a surprise. Uh, a, a town of Oxford's size uh, and the student body can support a certain level of things. But uh, we have heard uh, a desire for some more diversity of certain things like restaurants. So. Uh, again, we're hearing that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, I think, at our, our next meeting. So that's great. And uh, sorry, these are getting so small. It's great. <laughs> what that means is we've got a lot of different answers, which is, is a good thing. Because you, you know what, Chris, is a word I, I, I wrote down early and I anticipated here is diversity of thought, right? Yes. We've got a college community. One of the greatest things about a college community is people have a wide variety of backgrounds, um, great educational attainment levels. And I think this, this, increasingly smaller set of texts here proves that point out. One thing that pops to me though, Chris, here has to do with transportation congestion. You know, one of the things that we battle with in a comp plan is always kind of, you know, bouncing between these things that we can control, you know, within our community, whether it's in city hall or in our budgeting and our project, our capital improvements. And it's the stuff that we can really only influence, right? Like we can be at the table where good decisions are made regionally. A lot of those are economic development things. A lot of those are transportation things where, you know, we've got a great road network, but we don't control in Oxford a lot of those roads. Those are, whether it's county or it's the state, we got to influence others to help us make good choices there, right? Good point. And the other thing is Oxford is is a, a point uh, between other places. It's an important destination, but it's really got a rate, not surprising there, radial street pattern. In other words, uh, communities from every compass point are connecting to Oxford. So uh, traffic goes through Oxford to get to other places. So um, one of the things we can do to, you know, communities can do to try to address traffic is to create more of a, a network. And, and uh, historic Oxford's got a really great grid network that does distribute traffic. But uh, as we get out to the edges, that really does funnel uh, into those kind of radial streets, which, which does increase traffic issues and congestion. We also know we've got the Railroad tracks and that crossing that, that creates some interesting uh, situations at times, particularly when trains coming. So, uh, and you know, we will definitely thing, talk Chris, about addressing it. Pops on the, on this list for me, and I think we've got a great uh, set in here. So, Sarah, we might move to the next question in just a second. But one thing I would point out is, is you know, this idea of, of restaurants and some of you know we talked a little bit about the retail, the additive nature of that of, of some of that retail, especially when we think about the Mile Square and you know some of those those institutions really. <laughs> that have been with you for forever and, and what they add. It's been a rough year, a couple yeah, of years for those folks. And to be able to re retain, um, it, to be able to secure uh, uh, those uses moving forward, it's just so imper important. That is, that's part of your DNA, right? You know, that's what makes this place one of the best college towns, you know, other than Athens, Ohio, in uh, the, you know, the state of Ohio and really around the country. Let's, Sarah, with 175 great yeah, responses here. Yeah, Chris, why don't we move on to this, this next one? Um, you know, important question. You know, if we think about the future, you know, we really want to know, you know, you got a lot of stuff that, that, that's important about securing and maintaining, but there also might be some missing pieces here. So, you know, what's missing in Oxford that might make it a more welcoming, more livable place for all? You know, that, that term livable, Chris, we hear that a, a lot yeah, you know, around true. the country as we, as we travel and as we work. It gets defined a little differently everywhere, you know, we go. But essentially, I think we're talking about kind of the same thing in the, in, in the United States and, and more generally in, in the urban world. It's places that are, are easygoing and, and easy to get around and just easy, right? Um, it's a big deal. I see a lot already popping up here. Right. about housing again yep entertainment uh again rough year last couple of years but a, a, a big deal um is part of this yeah and, and one of the things we're going to be talking about throughout this process is you know things like covid have pushed some of the transitions that were already happening uh the retail the impact of online sales uh, the digital kind of revolution the work from home uh, these are all things that are affecting not just Oxford, but all cities and things we all need to grapple with. Uh, what does the future look like uh, and how do we best guide it to uh, meet our needs and uh, make it a place that we want to, Oxford a place we want to live. 
instead. Yeah, and, and Chris, I see a really interesting comment here right in the center of this jobs for trailing spouses piece. You know, as That's a, big as a college community, yep. all college communities struggle with this idea of the tag along, if you will, and how do we create uh, or, or, or work toward uh, a little bit more kind of economic diversity of, in, within the place, right? And it's not to say that you're ever going to fully escape the idea of you've got a major institution here and that's a big deal, an important deal, and in a lot of ways is, is the origin story, right? But on the right. other end of the spectrum, there's opportunities to continue to, to, um, to add an economic footprint here, one that's still additive, you know, especially when you think about work from home opportunities in, in the modern context. So really one of the important. things reading between the lines that we like to talk about, it, I think Oxford wants to be a place where people can age in place. We saw some early comments right at the beginning about we didn't ask about retirees, which is a great point. Um, we know there's there's people at different demographic age groups and uh, some are probably more addressed in Oxford than others. And so how do we create uh, the network, the amenities, the services uh, that make all age groups uh, have the things that, that create a great quality of life? And, and we know there's some areas I think it sounds like people like have us addressed. Yeah. And there's data to support that now too, Chris, when you think about retirees and where they want to be, you know, in, in, those, in those golden years, college communities you can get away from some of the noise, at least, you know, are really great places, walkable, uh, strong, uh, vibrant, uh, you know, places to, uh, uh, to be in those, in, those, in those years of life. I'm also seeing a couple things in here, Chris, around transportation and access. You know, yeah. one of the things that Sarah flashed with that um, live work analysis is the fact that, you know, you are a member of a larger region, right? And there are um, uh, commutes happening. Uh, we talked about the trailing spouses here a, a second ago, but um, you know, that, that recognition, I think it speaks back to, Chris, that idea of, of the things you control, the things you influence, you know, trying to be partners and be loud at those conference tables when decisions are made that affect you. Absolutely. And then we're seeing a, a number of people, and I think it's an important point we've talked about internally is uh, how do we continue to diversify uh, the economy and the, the employment base of Oxford. I think that's very important and something we need to, to focus on. Yeah. It, it, additionally, student relationship. I, I saw this kind of this idea of, of constant, you know, maintenance on that town gown relationship and how one affects the other. It is, um, it, it's a challenge that, that communities like yours face, but I'd say in a lot of, a lot of ways, it's a good challenge to have, right? Because it just means you've got folks that are interested on two sides uh, of that of, of that coin. Waffle House, that's pretty good. There you go. Chris, that's, that's what right. we could eat next time we're there. <laughs> that's right. We saw Panera there. earlier. <laughs> At least they're open, you know, that's all, right. all hours. But we Public have, we restrooms, have... I see that come up a few times. That's interesting, Chris. Well, something we'll have to dive into a little bit more here. I, I agree. I agree. Okay, let's do one that a uh, um, little less open-ended here. But what we, we you know, we're, uh, Sarah threw a lot of topics out there. Again, comprehensive, capital C, holistic. In, in modern comp planning, you know, Chris, I, we, we're, we're covering a lot of topics. And we'd love to know, you know, you think about the $100 game here, right? If you're going to spend, how, what are some of the most important topics that this plan ought to address? Um, on your menti, you're going to see a little bit of a different screen as we get to this question, but it ought to be fairly self-evident. We've got some folks coming in right now. Um, see if you can help us rank these things and give some order to, you know, where we ought to be spending our time. Right. We're going to address all of these, but it's always good to know if there are certain areas that people feel are really important for us to spend some time and focus on energy on. So, yeah, no help. surprise coming out of the gate. Housing, like Secretariat, is leading the pack. <laughs> uh, that's obviously been a, a, a major um, uh, resonant point that has come up in most of our stakeholder um, sessions. You know, it, uh, Chris, we, we've had this conversation in a, in a wide variety of, of places, and I mentioned a little bit earlier how no, no community has gotten this right, right just yet or figured this out. Um, but what I've been really impressed with, I think, in, in your context is how committed folks are to finding, you know, at least your version of the first step or the, the early solution, you know, yeah. to this. Um, so much of this is baked into product. I say product, I mean like single family houses, duplexes, multifamily uh, apartment blocks, and the price point. Uh, yes. And, you know, we have supply demand issues. Um, it's a complicated question, right, Chris? Absolutely. Well, we even heard, and I think I saw some of the previous question, you know, there's 
I think families are interested in living in the square mile, but really feel like that's kind of been taken over by students. And so that's something to address that we need to have environments that, because uh, there's different kinds of living environments where the different people feel uh, comfortable and, and can locate. So something to, to spend some time and thought on. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, the other one that's, that's interesting to me that pops up here, we talked about economic development. I think one thing we struggle with in a comprehensive plan like this is how do we define that and how do we find at some point in this work, we're going to get to actions, right? So we're going to get to projects, policies, programs, things, a playbook of things that you can do to advance toward your goals and your vision. Economic development is always an interesting one to me because, you know, how to, how, how do we start to make moves there, right? That's yep. like the turning the cruise ship type thing, Chris, yep. you know, and, and how do we actually start to influence that, uh, it, whether it's through, uh, you know, incentives, whether it's through programs or structures, or even frankly, even if it's, if it's through zoning, right? What can we doing or how can we get out of the way in some instances uh, of that challenge? I like seeing that people generally feel that uh, relations between Miami University and uh, the city of Oxford appear to be not the priority. It's not like they're pretty good. So, which is our sense too. Obviously, yeah. there's some coordination to have be had, some discussions to be had. But uh, hey, Chris, this, I, this I love I, I love seeing the climate and sustainability concern on this yeah. piece too. Just just because you know so much of what we learned about Oxford is a place that really cares. You know, global, local, whatever it is, these issues are important to us and will affect us. And the statements around you know climate change, but also statements around sustainability locally have have been very impressive. And I think. As Sarah and, and you, Chris, and I have, have, have studied that, I think what we really want to get to in this plan are, are, are a series of statements. What can we do, right? You know, we can't go out and, and, and move that three degree down, right? We, we can't do that. But what can we do locally to be participants in, 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 you know, in, the right, in the right side of that conversation? So let's give this just one more minute, see if anyone yeah. else go. Oh, I'm sorry. We, no, I, think, <laughs> I think we got We got it. We about, got so, it. Yeah, yeah. Remember, if you're still answering, you can continue to answer and there'll be a button at the top says move to this. this current It'll record slide. it. We'll still get it. Yeah. But Chris, we've, um, we've talked a lot tonight. We've shared a, a lot of information, collected a lot of great ideas, but we don't pretend, one, to have all the answers, or two, that we've that we didn't miss something. So I'd love to see from the group if you've got any other comments or ideas or you know, concerns or even frankly, just topics you know, that we haven't shared tonight or that you want us to, um, to focus on. Um, there's a lot out there to study um, you know, in this work and what we end up having is running out of time. We don't ever run out of curiosity right. or interest, right? right? We, just, we just run out of time. Well, thank you all for your good questions. I see that I pr appreciate the comment about the presentation. Uh, Sarah and, and the rest of the crew put a lot of work and Zach into that. Um, but uh, just a reminder again, the presentation will be posting that on the website uh, so you can take your time and look through it. Uh, that'll be important. And there are a number of good questions and comments that you all came up with. Uh, some of them, things like talking about the uh, number of students and how it affects the census. We'll provide a little more detail on that. We didn't get into that level of detail in the presentation, but uh, there are some good questions we'll try to answer as well as we go forward. Yeah, no doubt, Chris. And you know, it, the, the the problem with the first meeting is we're always pretty wide open here, right? We want to hear from you. We want to know what your kind of base level, you know, opportunities and concerns that you see for Oxford, you know, really are. But as we move forward, you know, Chris and, and Sarah and, and and the whole crew from the city here. You know, we intend to get more specific, you know, uh, it's about defining and then refining, I think, with you and having some objects to reflect on, um, projects, ideas, quite frankly, what we can do, tangible or intangible, to improve those, those three cues of quality of life, quality of place, quality of opportunity. That's what this is. That's at the core, that's what this is really, you know, all about. I think we got about... 15 or minutes so left, Chris, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, if there are any, uh, uh, if we could have any questions from our group. I think, you, you know, if you've used Zoom before, you know, you can raise your hand. Um, I think if, and I think I'll see that here on my right side, but anyone wanted to ask a question verbally, make a statement, uh, limited to about a minute so we can get through a couple of these, uh, would love uh, to host a few of those. So I see, uh, I see Pam's asked one, so maybe you can call on Pam. Pam, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah. 
Now, Alyssa, go ahead and unmute. Yeah. Hi, Pam. You can go ahead and unmute, then you can ask your question. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep, perfect. Thanks, Pam. Okay, sorry, it took quite a few buttons to get through to that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about, about that. that. Sorry. You. No, it's okay. Um, so are there ways to submit like actual specific ideas, um, you know, at, uh, proposing anything specific? Um, is that like on your um, website or anything like that? Yes. So we'll show you one more time here when we're done. Um, but yeah, if you go to the website, the Conference and Plan website, and we'll put the, the link up in here in a minute, uh, there's something called an ideas wall. And there we go. Thank you. Uh, there's an ideas wall, and basically it's post-it notes. It's digital post-it notes, and you can click on them. There's a couple different topics. Uh, try to find one that matches what you want. There you go. But you want to talk about, and you can get as detailed as you want. And we're going to get, believe it or not, we're going to go through all of these, and we're going to pull on these for our next meeting as well to help uh, direct some of the stuff we'll talk about at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And Chris, it, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Pam. I was just saying thanks. Yep. And well, then thank, again, thank you. No, and in addition to that, Chris, if, if whoever the ghost that's operating the mouse right now could go back and also show us the uh, the uh, uh, there it is, social pinpoint interactive map. We love using this tool yeah. because we're geographers and planners, and we like to try to attach ideas to a, a physical place. If you zoom in on this map, it'll give you some directions, and you can actually drop an idea right directly onto the map if you have a place-based idea or opportunity. This is a wonderful tool for us. You know, in some communities, we get hundreds of ideas that are located here, things that flower into to parks, things that flower into trails, uh, new investment ideas, all those sorts of things. This is really helpful for us. And then just to reiterate, because again, I know uh, because the conditions uh, this time, we're doing this remotely, but we also will ha we have uh, uh, paper copies and postcards uh, around town. Yeah, Sam, I don't know if you want to get into that uh, for people that don't feel as comfortable to, to share their comments with us. Yeah, Chris, uh, thanks. Yeah, we do have postcards around town, uptown, uh, and strategic places around town, and, and those can be uh, handwritten. Zach's got one there on the screen and can be dropped in the, the three utility payment boxes or, of course, brought in our office as well. Thanks. Perfect. And uh, Chris, Sam, I noticed Alexandria also raised her hand. Sorry, Alexandria, I didn't mean to skip you there in the order. You want to go ahead and unmute? Love to hear from you. I'll have to catch up. Make sure we, we got to unmute on our side, and then you can unmute on your side. Sure. Uh, so actually, let's, let's go to, to Amy. Amy, could you go ahead and ask your unmute and ask your questions? I know it's a million buttons. I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to say thank you. I actually accidentally clicked the raise hand button. This is a very informative presentation and I look forward to uh, being involved in the process as a resident. Thanks. Great, thank, thank you, you so much. And, and Amy, we look forward to, you know, having a meeting not like this in the right. future too. You know, and, it's, been a, it's been a rough time to try to do this work, but we really appreciate all of you being great sports and, and contributing. I saw Steve. Uh, Steve, you've got a question. I'd, I'd love to, to hear from you. If you want to unmute. Can you guys be patient with us first? Unmute you before you can unmute. We'll see here. Okay, All here right. we go. In Great. the preliminary booklet, you may have read with respect to income and commute uh, and commuting that the conclusion is as follows. And my question is, how do we address this phenomenon? Okay. The, the, the conclusion is, when considering the totality of all employees with some relationship to Oxford, whether it is work, home, or both, the majority are residents commuting to jobs in other communities. Yes. That's right from the, the preliminary Ohio. And I think that that's, uh, unfortunately, it speaks for itself. My yes. question revolves around how can we address this uh, in what many many, uh, many different ways uh, can we address it? Not, not using one tool or two tools, but three or four tools. Is, is that a, does that question make sense to you? Absolutely, yeah. and Steve, you're, you're right on. I think it's one of the critical issues that we have to tackle as part of this effort. We'll rely on you. We'll, we'll come back, that's one of the things we'll do at our next meeting. 
uh, in April is we, that's one of the questions we're going to tackle. And we're going to put a lot of thought to it. And we'll come back with some uh, probably to your point, it will be a lot of things uh, rather than one thing and get your reaction as to what things really resonate. But it, it's a tough it's a tough issue that we need to address. We need to diversify. Well, thank you for hearing the question out. Yeah. yeah, and Steve, I really appreciate that question too because, you know, quite frankly, it's one that comes up a lot in communities like yours. Is is you know, and the idea I think in this one is is a is an example of other questions where we're probably not going to fully solve this, and maybe we we don't want to, right? But it's about adding options, opportunities. You know, great communities are diverse in all those types of ways, economically as well. So. I think for us in addressing this, you, you have the idea of a multifaceted solution. That's what we're after. That's a more secure one. That allows us to experiment, make small bets, see what's working, and then lean into those things that work, lean away from those that maybe maybe not getting the right flavor or the right uh, energy. So, well you know, said. So I, think I, I think we can good. tackle it together. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. We look Thanks, forward to sir. that. Well, I don't see any more hands raised um, in, in our group of 100. Um, so uh, Sam, Chris, Sarah, Zach, Jessica, uh, and uh, the rest of the crew, um, I think of which, oh, really wanted to thank everyone for being here, but I'd, I'd love to give Jessica, Zach, and, and Sam, you know, the kind of the last word for this evening. And, and we'll be back hopefully with you uh, in April to talk a lot more about what's next in, uh, in your community. I'd like to, before you all jump in, I'd like to say one last thing, which is we really appreciate all of you being, uh, devoting this time, being with us tonight. But really, this is your plan. It's so important that you get all of your, your family, friends, neighbors, coworkers uh, to participate. I, I, we saw a comment about more students. Uh, we, we really want to get everyone engaged. So if you can let people know, point them to the website, let them know about our next meeting. We'll be doing more advertising as well. Uh, we really would love you to all engage and, and as many as you can share your ideas and aspirations will be wonderful. And this builds, right, Chris? Round one builds into round two, builds into round three. This is an iterative process. It's a growing conversation. It's never too late to join. To right. Bring your neighbors, bring your friends. Anybody that cares about Oxford ought to be involved in this. This is a big deal. Uh, so Sam, Zach, Jessica, Sarah. I'll just jump in quickly and say thanks for joining us tonight. Please do go share your ideas on the social pinpoint or pick up a postcard around town. We place them at many local businesses and in, and in public places. Um, you can drop them into the utility bill boxes or bring them in or put your ideas online. Um, and like Kyle said, these ideas are going to build upon each other. So the next public meeting, we're going to be sharing some this is what we think we heard from you and get your responses. And so each time we're going to kind of um, respond to what we're hearing and then get your feedback. So thanks for joining us and have a good evening. I'll let Zach and Sam say anything else. Yeah, I'll just also share with everyone. So um, you would have provided your email address when you signed up for this virtual event tonight. So you are all effectively added to our in-depth coverage listserv. So um, everyone will receive email updates as we move forward through the process. And I'll add that um, I'd love to hear any of your dreams and big ideas. Some of the things that have been happening over the past few years have been thought about 20 or even 30 years ago. So um, you may not even get to experience some of the things that uh, the ideas that come out and get developed. But uh, if you don't get them out there, then they won't happen. So uh, please uh, send in those ideas and ask those questions. Thank you. Really quick before we go, I saw that someone in the Q&A asked what's next, and I realized that we didn't get to the very last slide because we were too busy um, hearing from you all your ideas on Mentimeter, but really quickly to sum up with some next steps, we're going to be taking all the feedback we heard from you tonight, all the feedback from Social Pinpoint. Uh, there will be an online survey of the same questions we asked tonight that will be on the project website. Um, and we're going to come back at that next meeting that we keep talking about um, with some draft plan goals and objectives. So again, these are the next steps. Um, we hope to see you all on April 21st. And I think uh, that will wrap up our event. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful yeah. night. Take care. Thanks, all.